well, welcome everybody. So uh, before I turn over the floor to Dan, um, I'm just going to take a few moments to tell you all a little bit more about myself and about the Map Techworks program and Map for Nonprofits, which is kind of like the umbrella organization for what we do here. Uh, so um, first of all, how many people uh, are new to this whole thing? I know Josh. Okay, great. Cool. Well, uh, welcome. It's really great to see new faces here, and I hope to see you soon at one of the great things that we've got going on. Um, so to give you a little background on that TechWorks, basically our mission for, um, our reason for being is to uh, help nonprofits unleash mission through the effective use of technology. And uh, the way we achieve that mission is by providing free and low-cost learning opportunities like this one about technology. So um, the whole Tech Up and Up program I took that slide you off. You took that slide off? Come on, man. I can't <laughs> bring it back. Rude. No, it's okay. Right. No, it's okay. okay. Sorry. Okay, I have a whole slide about this, but I'll just have to riff. Um, <laughs> so basically, uh, the Tech It Up a Notch program is just sort of one subset of the many things that we do here. It's focused on helping all of you as um, you know the professional IT staff for your organization or the accidental techie for your organization, um, take back learning opportunities that you can then share with your colleagues to help them um, raise their technology literacy. And the purpose of this, you know, the most obvious purpose is just to kind of give them a little bit more um, learning about a certain topic. Um, some of the sort of hidden purposes um, are, uh, first of all, it just makes people more comfortable talking about technology in general. If you can find opportunities to educate them about technology on an ongoing basis. Um, it also elevates you as a leader on your staff um, by you know, showing people that you do have this expertise. Um, so if you guys are thinking of making technology change later, it sort of sows the seeds for you know, that process. So that's kind of our reason for doing this little program. Um, in addition to this program, we also have some really great uh, sort of deep dive sessions that we do in the morning. These are two hour sessions that go more deeply into a tech topic. Um, we have actually on the evaluation sheet, which hopefully all of you guys have. If you don't, I've got some extras and pass them around. Uh, a list of some of our free programs that are coming up. Um, we've got one on November 14th, which is all about uh, selecting client tracking databases. So definitely worth checking out if you guys are involved in the human services industry and need that kind of uh, technology solution. Uh, we also have um, a sort of social happy hour coming up uh, next week as well. And then we do have two paid programs that are not listed on here, um, but they're really cool. You should check them out on our website. Uh, one of them is about um, strategies to make your email fundra fundraising campaigns more persuasive. And uh, there's another one that we're going to be doing that's all about um, technology, uh, diving into security, sort of advanced security for your nonprofit. And then we have a third one that I'm kind of blanking on. Oh yeah, wait, it's search engine optimization for nonprofits. So that's another great one we've got coming up. Um, so yeah, so definitely consider signing up for these things. Um, we also have a technology listserv as well, which is kind of like a phone and helpline, another great resource that you can subscribe to for free. Um, so that's sort of TechWorks in a nutshell, and um, this whole tech up notch thing. I will turn the floor over to Dan, and he's gonna tell us all about mobile security for your tablets, cell phones, and more. Thanks, Dan. Thank you very much, Carrie. Good afternoon, thank you for having me. Uh, the purpose of today's uh, presentation, I'm going to try a couple of different spots out so I can kind of get my group here, so for, work with me. Uh, the purpose of, hey Rob, come on in. Uh, the purpose of today's presentation is to share with you practical ways that you can help both yourself and your users keep the information on your mobile devices, which are more prolific than ever, of course, secure. So let's be honest information on those devices is not safe. Uh, for all the reasons listed here, uh, information can be leaked out of your device without you even knowing it. Uh, some obvious, more obvious than others, uh, but without uh, even uh, being connected, to, you know, just connecting to a wireless network, something that we do all the time, can be something that uh, can introduce potential hazards. I'm not trying to scare you, but I'm trying to set the, set the groundwork here for a conversation that I hope will extend not just here, but into the organizations like Carrie was mentioning. So what I propose today for an agenda, an overview, is talking about some security settings on the mobile devices themselves, just some practical best practices that you can take away and do today for yourself and help others within your organization as well. 
some of these uh, are actually listed on the documents that are uh, that you have in front of you. The second thing I'm going to do is help you become aware of and avoid scams that are going to try and lure you to give away information that you may not be interested in giving up. Uh, we'll move on into software apps, maintaining those apps. We all have dozens, if not hundreds, of different pieces of software on our own smartphones. And the IT people in the room know that every app that you add is another invitation for problems. Uh, we'll move on to actually protecting the data on the computer using some backup. Uh, then segue into privacy in the world of social media and wrap with device management, remote device management for your own smartphone or individual smartphones and tablets, as well as device management for an entire organization. So before I jump into this agenda, I'd like to just share with you a couple of sort of philosophies, uh, best practices. The fact is, what I'm going to be showing you today really isn't anything that new or exciting. If anything, Roger here is an expert on security as well and does other no, come on. Oh, you are. <laughs> and uh, so anyway, hopefully you'll correct me if I mess anything up but, or forget anything. Uh, but what I'd like to mention is what I'm going to talk to you today is nothing going to be, it's not going to be anything that earth shattering, but actually complements uh, what we're already doing today and some of the best practices that we probably already implemented years ago from the world of desktops, you know, including good strong passwords. Uh, avoiding the use, if you can, altogether of kiosks and public computers. And of course, using trusted Wi-Fi, although that could be very difficult. Uh, and, and preferentially, if possible, just using your own uh, mobile hotspot on, a, on your phone. Uh, that may be some of the best, safest Wi-Fi that, that's available. So uh, keep this in mind. The things that you already know and are doing still apply. Uh, and this is just going to complement them. Uh, the next thing I'd like to do is share with you an idea here, just to put things in perspective. You know, back in the day when we had these flip phones and it was just a couple of phone numbers and text messages, today our mobile devices have just as much, if not more, data stored on them or accessible by them than our desktop computer counterparts. And we've gone through all the trouble to lock down and provide security on our desktops, but the mobile device world it's a, it's a, you know, it's just a free-for-all, uh, generally speaking. So uh, what I would argue is that we should be spending even more time uh, around the conversation of security with mobile devices than we are today, because even more is at stake. And these things go with us everywhere we are, and sit in our bags and our cars and all these vulnerable places. So uh, one more slide before we jump into the content. And I just want to give you a couple of cautions and disclaimers about what you're going to be seeing. No, it's not scary, but just be aware the things that I'm going to be showing you are screenshots from current devices and modern operating systems. The device you have in your pocket right now will probably look different. And the devices that your users are using every day are probably going to be different as well. So what I'm going to provide are best practices and general guidelines. Your own device will definitely differ and may not even have some of the features that we might be talking about. Although I'll try to alert those when that comes up. Especially in terms of encryption, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Uh, not all devices support encryption. So you might go look for that setting and see it's not there. The other thing I just want to mention is, while I come to you sharing with you the recommendations and the practical advice that I give to all the rest of our nonprofit clients and business clients, I'm not a certified security expert, I would argue that's actually a benefit to you because at this point, uh, I'm going to be more likely to provide you a balanced approach to security that's not going to make your uh, handy dandy smartphone completely useless because it's so locked down. A couple other mention things I just want to mention are nothing trumps common sense. So the things that I, and this is really has two kind of prongs to it, things I'm going to share with you and recommend to you. Uh, no matter how you implement them, it could still possibly be for you. So it's still important to use your common sense, your experience, and your judgment. Did you expect that in a security conversation, right? Just use your best judgment if you're not sure. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is, um, you know, don't go overboard. Uh, this is not security for the sake of security. This is security to help, as Carrie was mentioning, further the mission 
and support the vision of your organizations. And then uh, finally, uh, I just want to make sure that everybody's aware of this. Even if you do every last thing I'm going to recommend it for you today, for your users to do, every last one of those things could still be completely thwarted and find yourself in a pickle. Because there's no perfect answer. And again, what I encourage you to do is have this beginning be the beginning of the conversation about a security culture within your organization. Also, I just want to mention I take questions throughout the conversation today. Uh, don't feel uh, put out if I table your question till later. And um, it just means that's how it's, it'll just work better in the conversation today. And I also encourage you to please jot down your key takeaways, at least one. And then please be willing to share that with the group at the end. And then if you still don't have one, maybe you can find a, a good nugget right at the end. My hope is that you'll be able to take back some of the thoughts from today's conversation and implement them at your organization immediately. So without further ado, security settings for your smartphone. These are just basic uh, setting changes that you can do today to make your phone a little bit more secure, particularly in the event that you lose or your phone becomes stolen. Uh, this is a, uh, kind of a funny screenshot of the pin entry screen. And I already hear all the sighs in the room. I don't want to use a pin code. That's obnoxious. But wait a second. What I was just mentioning is that this device is a gateway to your whole entire world. And did I even mention that for my very own smartphone, I can actually post to not even my, not just my Facebook page, but Facebook pages of organizations that I work with that I've got probably 10 years of email accessible from this thing, this, this little device. Now does that put things in, I think, a little bit better perspective? Now what I'm going to propose here is a good pin code that's not just a series of the same number, 1, 2, 3, 4, 1, 1, 1, 1, et cetera. But I'm also going to suggest that you enable the screen lock feature on you and your users' smartphones. This is a screenshot from an Android device, much like the one I have in my hand. Uh, while you can go a little bit crazy and have it so the power button instantly locks the device and set the auto lock feature to one minute, I would say that would be a little aggressive. Because every time you press the power button on your phone, just turn off the screen and save power, you're going to be re-entering that pin code. So I leave that feature off and I have my phone auto lock after five minutes. From the world of, and this is an iPhone by the way, forgot to mention, but today we'll be mostly talking about iPhone and Android. That covers 98 or so percent of the devices out there. Uh, note that some of the principles that we'll be discussing do apply. Some of the features that we will uh, present today are available on Windows and Blackberry. Here's what it looks like from your uh, desktop computer. This is a screenshot from a Mac. We've already been doing this for years. If you leave your screen for more than five, ten minutes, it goes to a screensaver and uh, prompts you for a password when you come back to it. If you don't have this feature turned on on your mobile devices, including laptops, I would, I would highly encourage it. Uh, it's pretty unobtrusive, takes only a second, and you'll be surprised at how fast you can get it uh, entering that code with your thumb. The next thing I would suggest uh, on mobile devices, including laptops and smartphones, is uh, insert information into the owner info field. What this does is, and I'll show you a screenshot here, it gives somebody who has found a device information on how to get that back to you. I'm going to tell you a story in just a moment about how this can be helpful, and how I wish I had this function uh, on a couple of years ago. Uh, good things to include on this uh, are an alternate phone number. Don't just put your cell phone number. Uh, and, I mean, I'm just saying. Uh, to, a way that somebody could, could uh, get your device back to you by calling from a different device. Uh, here's what it looks like on a Mac. Uh, I have this turned on as well. Uh, hopefully you would imagine if somebody did find your laptop or phone that they'd want to get it back to you. Okay? And this allows them to do that. So I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, I was uh, working out. It was kind of in the evening in the gym. I had my phone in my jeans pocket locked in the locked locker. Okay? Worked out, came back, phone was gone. Of course, I just thought I'd lost it because that's the first thing I assume. Uh, fortunately, I had the pin code set so I knew if it was going to be lost or stolen or whatever, that my data at least was more or less safe. Okay? 
So I kept calling and calling, it kept ringing, but I couldn't find it. I looked, I called and find him, look in my car, wasn't there. Call and check my wife's car, wasn't there. Under the, finally, the next morning, I keep, I'm still trying to find my phone. Thankfully, it was a weekend. And somebody answers the thing. I'm like, what? Who are you? Like, oh, we, my kid heard this thing vibrating in a snowbank. Uh, and uh, we, they picked up, I mean, it was kind of garbled or whatever. And they said, yeah, do you want it back? I was like, yeah, sure. Uh, so I drove and picked it up. Uh, I was in a residential neighborhood in Edina. Okay. okay, and I was in Minnetonka at the time. I don't know, we, I still don't know what exactly happened. The phone was ruined, uh, essentially, but my data was sick. Uh, they gave up after completely locking out the device. They had tried the pin code too many times. The device locked out, uh, and they chucked it out of the window, I imagine. The $200 device, so what? The information on it, priceless. Uh, so that's just a per I mean, everybody, I bet everybody in the room has a story like that. Because at Tech Guru, we hear this stuff all the time. Laptop stolen, smartphone stolen, tablet stolen. Uh, if you were in my shoes, this would be an overhand. Uh, now, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about encryption. We mentioned how putting a pin code prevents somebody from accessing your device while it's on. A little bit about uh, encryption is, there is storage in here, just like there's a hard drive in your computer, there is storage in these phones that is maintaining all of that sensitive information that we just talked about. So, you have your pin code on, somebody still wants to get access to your information. All they really have to do is plug your phone into their computer and download it. That's about all it would take. Enter encryption. While there are some pros and cons that I'll discuss momentarily, encryption secures the information on the phone with a minimal performance degradation that you probably won't notice. Uh, note that encryption is a one-way street. Once you encrypt, you cannot go back. Uh, uh, this is an Android, a picture of an Android or Google device over here. Those take a little bit longer to encrypt, up to an hour. So I'd suggest having a power adapter connected should you decide to undertake this. As a matter of fact, when you hit encrypt, you'll get this lengthy warning message on an Android device. Apple devices are slightly different. They encrypt just the private information or personal information. They don't actually encrypt all the apps as well, uh, which, is, which is good enough for me if you ask, if you ask me. Uh, but it doesn't take quite as long to encrypt. Uh, but again, it's still a one-way street. Encryption simply scrambles the information on the storage device so that should somebody try to access it, they wouldn't be able to read the contents without knowing your secret key. Okay, which you set during the encryption process. I also would suggest uh, encrypting the hard drive on a laptop, uh, any device really that's going to be traveling around. On a Mac, it looks like this and is called File Vault. Very same concept. Enter a password. Uh, you can even save a recovery key in case you forget your password that you can use to decrypt down the road. Very minimal performance degradation. Very large increase in peace of mind. Here's what it looks like on a PC. They call it BitLocker. Chances are you already have these features on computers today. Uh, so it's something that can be turned on with minimal pain. I'm going to pause for just a moment between sections here and uh, take any brief questions uh, before we move on to uh, scams. Any questions on the encryption or security settings? Can you go over again where on the iPhone that um, you put in the information? Thank you. The pro oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if I understand correctly, you're asking, how do I uh, set the owner info on an yes. iPhone? Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. Bummer. The setting doesn't mm -hmm. exist. So you have there to is like a workaround. Make a graphic that says yep. that or something? There, is an there are free apps out there okay. on the, uh, the uh, uh, app market that will put information onto an image and save that as your wallpaper. Thank okay. you for asking that, that's perfect. Yeah. Yes, sir. Question, so if I have, if I have a tablet that has you know, a Google Calendar on it, mm -hmm. and someone checks their, their Yahoo Mail on it, mm -hmm. so even if there is a, a, a screen lock on it, Somebody can plug that into the, the computer and could they, could they download those, those data? 
That's a great question. So if I understand correctly, you're asking, you know, logged in a Yahoo account, Yahoo Mail or calendar, is that, is that data that stays on the storage? Is it staying on the storage internally? Uh, only what's cached uh, generally is the answer to that question. Uh, what I mean by that is to make the performance fast on your, on your smartphone and even a computer, uh, while you're working with the calendar and mail for that matter, uh, the apps are kind of saving pieces of it that you access frequently for mm -hmm. quick future access. That is the information that will be on the storage of the device itself. How do I know what's cached? You wouldn't know. Okay. It's an algorithm that's being generated based on what it thinks you might want to access to make it quicker for you. But so you just assume it's all there. Okay. Sorry? But you can clear caches. Yep. 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 You can clear caches or you can just encrypt your storage and be done with it. I'm going to close questions for the moment. Is that okay? Okay, Roger, last one. Very quick. It yep. has to do with the screen that's yeah. showing right there. The erase data feature, yep. that's something that I use and uh, I recommend that people use it. But what again, does it do, Roger? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds kind of scary to me. <laughs> <laughs> if a person, well exactly, there is a risk involved. If a person tries to uh, get into my phone and they enter an incorrect PIN code ten times, then the phone automatically erases all the data erases on it. Itself. We understand that, so that's what he's talking about down here. Erase all data on this iPhone after 10 failed attempts. So it's, it's quite secure. However, um, if you have small children, <laughs> you may want to think that's twice about it. Yeah, that's a copy. Right. I'm going to move on for a uh, second time. i got about four or five modules left, but I love the conversation. Uh, I'm going to move into scams. I'm going to help you be aware of some of the scams that are out there and more prevalent now. Uh, but first, I got an offer you can't refuse. <laughs> I'm going to give you a $1,000 Home Depot gift card, and all you have to do is give me your zip code. A little more than your zip code. I'd also like your social security number, your bank account number, routing number, checking account uh, number as well, mm -hmm. your uh, Facebook username and password, uh, any kind of bank login information, uh, and then I will, I promise to mail it to you. Okay, <laughs> you might see it never. Uh, you know, that's pretty obvious, right? That uh, the information that you're about to divulge to me is a little bit more valuable than nothing, uh, which is what this offer is gonna provide to you. Unfortunately, uh, as you'll see in a moment, uh, it's not always painfully obvious that you are divulging that information to an untrusted source. Uh, I'm gonna show you a screenshot of some phishing. We've all heard of phishing. Great. Uh, these are all examples of Swishing, or SMS phishing. I did not coin that term, but I like it, so I'm using it. Uh, so here's a perfect example of, uh, uh, of something that you know you used to probably see or probably still would see in your email. Hey, your account has been locked out. Click here to log in and reset your password. What you don't realize is that when you click on this link, it's taking you to some other site that is not Fifth Third Bank. And in fact, when you enter your username and password, it's not to reset anything. They then collect the information from that form and then use it for uh, malicious purposes. Uh, this one's pretty obvious, and I'm going to help you understand why it's obvious in a moment. But here's another couple of examples, similar to the one we saw a moment ago from more of the desktop world. Uh, hey, this is kind of cool, and actually this almost looks legit, www.bestbuy.com, right? I'm going to mm -hmm. click on that. That must be official. Well, it's not. <laughs> and I'm going to help you know how to identify this. As a matter of fact, in the handout, I provided an anatomy of a, uh, I think I call it anatomy of a URL. A URL is a, a link, okay? So the first thing you would notice about this Fifth Third Bank one is that this URL has nothing to do with Fifth Third Bank. As a matter of fact, these banks usually don't put any URLs in these SMS messages anyway because of this, this prevalence of these phishing schemes. Uh, back to the Best Buy one. This looks good up to here www.bestbuy.com, but that's not how you actually understand a domain name. Domain name goes from right to left. And you start at the .biz, okay? that's called a top level domain. And this is what you register with the domain registrar, like Network Solutions or GoDaddy. Everything from here back are called subdomains. And those are easily manipulated by 
anybody. You can set up anything, www.facebook.com.org.whatever.whatever.com. Okay, these are easily manipulatable. This last piece, bxsy.biz, that is the part that matters. Okay, and actually anything that goes after the slash, and this has, an, this has a slash 53, anything after this slash is also can easily be, can be anything anybody would want it to be. Okay, moral of the story is delete these or anything that looks like it. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. The same best practices, common sense things kind of apply here. But then you get something like this. I, um, I'm a USAA card holder. So all of a sudden I said, oh, well, that makes sense. And then, uh, well, actually, those are the last four digits of my MasterCard from USAA. This is actually a legitimate text message. But that's scary, right? Because it's not too far different than the other one. But there are a couple key differences that I want to point out. And I did, I did at some point set this up with USAA. It knows a couple things that most scammers won't know. They won't know the last four digits of the card number. But I was at home with our newborn. I wasn't out shopping at Toys R Us. So I thought to myself, hmm, where's my wife? <laughs> so I gave her a call. Sure enough, she'd got some new baby accoutrements. And uh, so I felt comfortable replying Y or um, N that this was not fraud. But note that it didn't ask me to click on any links. And it knew, it, it helped me trust this message. Not because of where it came from. You can't quite see it up there, 25671. That's random. Okay? But it knew things about me that generally nobody else would really know unless you were the bank. On the back side of the handout, there is a, uh, how to, uh, what does it say? It might be a scam if you can apply those rules. Enjoy that. Here's what phishing looks like. Facebook, Facebook looks good to me. Got their logo. Oh, I better log in with my email password and email password. Wow, these guys are egregious. They don't just want my email for Facebook. They want my, let's say I use a Gmail account, they want that as well. That's great, so they can also proliferate. They're trying to just be able to proliferate this, uh, this fake message. But here's, here's a couple tip-offs to help you understand or help you know that this is a, a scam. First of all, again, that URL is kind of blanked out, unfortunately, with the screenshot I got here. But the ending URL is not Facebook.com. It's you something.com. Okay. The other thing is, this is a broken image. It's like a little little details, right? Facebook. Probably not going to have broken images on their site, generally. So those are two tip-offs. One thing I would mention is just if you're really not sure... Just close the browser window and open a new window with Facebook.com and just go directly to it if you're just not sure. That's generally a little bit more safer. I'm going to show you one more example of a mobile-specific scam. Here it is, Bank of America. This looks completely legit. Bankofamerica.com. I've got the green lock. I feel safe. Ignore this fake demo thing. Uh, but yeah, I feel totally safe. I'm going to, I'm going to sign and give it my log in and log into my bank account. But you're not. If you were to scroll down with your finger uh, for your iPhone users, and actually Androids do the same thing, you'll see the following. Android browsers and, and uh, mobile browsers hide the address bar. This is the real address bar. And the attacker here, that's what we call people that do. They, yeah. Oh, that's okay. clever. So uh, I'm going to say that again. They put an image of an address bar, a legit address bar, at the top of their web page. So if you didn't scroll down, you wouldn't see that you were being duped into logging in. Again, otherwise it looks perfectly legit. Okay? Mobile web browsers are really prone to this type of attack because they hide the address bar. Because generally you don't need to see that. But here it's another totally different URL. So, um, again, out of uh, respect for everybody's time, I'm going to actually just move on and not pause for questions at this moment. We're going to talk about software and apps, mobile apps specifically. Uh, before we talk about mobile apps, though, I'm going to share with you another best practice from the world of desktop computers, which is, generally speaking, it pays to keep your software up to date. In other words, in my humble opinion, I feel that 
it's more beneficial to install the latest updates from Microsoft and Google and Apple than the risks are of, of running outdated software. One thing that's included in Apple's software update, for example, is update to, updates to Safari. Safari is the web browser that we just were looking at. Uh, a lot of times Apple will release uh, updates to the browser that make it more secure. So running an insecure older version of your operating system means you're running an insecure older version of your browser as well, which is what is most likely going to be the way that you're going to be run into problems, we'll say. So this is what it looks like on an Android operating system. Looks like on, a, on an iPhone. Uh, nowadays, you can update your iPhone and Android phones OTA or over the air. It's really easy, pretty painless. Just do it. But now let's talk about apps. The uh, iPhone App Store, and this is a picture of the Android App Store. I'm not even going to really talk about the iPhone App Store, the Apple App Store, because generally the apps that are in there are pretty well vetted, very stringent process, are not going to run into too many problems. Generally speaking, that's not the case with the, um, unfortunately, Android or Google uh, Marketplace, it's called. You will occasionally run into apps that are not good and are bundled with malware or spyware that can do, uh, can more or less take over your phone and cause aggressive uh, advertisements, potentially access the data on your phone without your approval. The biggest way to have this happen uh, on an Android device is to bypass or override some of the security settings that are turned on by default that allow you to install apps that are not from the App Store. So generally if you leave the settings on by default that are already there, you'll be better off. And I can go into more detail after if you're interested on that. Furthermore, uh, installing apps that are have things like this which are trust marks or trust symbols and have good reviews, you're generally going to be okay. When you start running into apps that are a little bit more good, too good to be true or free or look like they can kind of bypass like carrier restrictions, uh, and especially if you do things like rooting your phone, then you really start to open things up. Rooting your device is installing uh, software or operating system on your phone that is not authorized by the manufacturer or has, and has been made separate from uh, the carriers and the manufacturers internal processes. But generally speaking, you're good to go if you look for these type of positive reviews and uh, avoid things that look like uh, too good to be true. The only other thing, uh, a couple of other suggestions I would have when installing apps uh, on either platform. Uh, when you click install, you're prompted with this screen. Has anybody seen this? These are the permissions not for you these are the permissions that the app has to access information on your device. So this is a little technical, full disclosure, it's a little technical. I mean, I usually just click right past this stuff. But what you might want to be thinking is uh, if it's an app that maybe wasn't reviewed quite as well, or it's a little bit fringe. Uh, for example, a photo editing app doesn't need to access my contacts, right? So if you see something like that, you know something funny might be happening. So just take a minute, take a second really, and just look to see what this app might be doing. I also, keep, uh, also suggest keeping your apps up to date. I configure most of my apps for automatic updating. It happens overnight, I just don't even know. Uh, same, same principle applies that keeping secure software, updated software is more secure. So I figured this question might come up it's a special kind of app called Mobile Antivirus. I don't personally use it myself. A couple of features, and there's a bunch of them out there. Tons of this mobile antivirus software. And you know, I generally recommend antivirus software on Windows computers as a good safe, uh, you know, as a safety measure. Uh, but I find that what's available out there for mobile phones to be generally useless and provide features that you can get for free in other ways. Uh, for example, anti-theft features, I'm going to show you ways that you can do that, the same kind of features uh, for free. Uh, app scanning and URL scanning, uh, you're probably better off just using common sense, in my opinion. Uh, and then backup of your data, I'm going to show you again how to do that for free. So 
I don't usually recommend. And they all they say free here. I don't know if you can see that, but uh, their freemium model is what their uh, other kind of their, their financial model. So they give you one or two things, uh, and then if you want to actually use some of the more advanced features that are these, uh, you pay four or five bucks. So I thought I would dispel that. Uh, but let's say that you've installed software on your phone and it's kind of gotten mucked up and you can't quite get it to get back to what it was or you've partially encrypted your device and you interrupted it for whatever reason and it's totally bricked and useless you always have this option you can uh, erase your phone and start over uh, so keep in mind that uh, uh, this is always available if you feel like something didn't just didn't go or doesn't feel quite right so speaking of erasing your phone, you might want to think about how the information is being backed up on it. So the next topic here would be data backup. Uh, on the left column, this is a kind of overly complicated table, I've included all the different types or examples of different types of data that probably live on the memory card in your phone. At least this is some of the things that I use. Uh, and on the right side are some suggested ways to back that information up. So I'll just do a couple highlights here. The built-in notes on iPhones used to not be backed up in any way until just recently, uh, if, you, if you do an iCloud or a, um, a Google or an Exchange account. So I always kind of told people to watch out for the, the built-in notes. If you can't access the information that's on your smartphone from some other portal online, it probably isn't being backed up or synchronized anywhere. Or if it's not in iTunes for the iOS world, that song isn't on both places, it probably isn't being backed up. Uh, now with the advent of Google accounts and Exchange servers and iCloud, it is way easier to back up your phones. And it happens over the air, uh, you know, just with, you know, within the last year or two, the best way to back up an iPhone was to literally plug it into your computer to back up all the photos. So take inventory, if you would, and help your users do the same, of uh, the information that's saved on their devices, and find ways to ensure that the data is being backed up. Uh, documents, you know, there's a ton of great tools for backing up and synchronizing documents. And notes, I use Evernote Cloud Sync, that is one of the thousand different note apps available, that, and many of which sync over the air. So take a moment and back up your data because you never know when you might need to wipe your phone <laughs> or when your kid helps you wipe your phone. Uh, I'd like to dive into now just a little bit about privacy and social media. This is a probably a series of three-hour conversations we could have. I'm going to give you the cliff notes. Uh, going back to that first graphic, these apps, social media, have a very high level of access to the information on your smartphone. And since that's the conversation we're having today, I think it makes sense to take stock, take inventory on what it is that you're connected with, what permissions you've provided these Facebook and Twitter to have to your information, and take a few minutes to think about and look at, and I'm going to show you how to do this, who are you liking and connecting with? The moment you do either one of these two activities, you are opening up your world to those, to that individual or those individuals. Uh, and the same thing with location sharing. I have a client who complained to me uh, last week that she was frustrated every time she posted on Facebook that would say where she was. She didn't like that. Uh, all those things can be shut off and disabled if you change. Uh, by default, unfortunately, a lot of these settings are leaning in the direction of sharing more and less privacy. So just know that if you, if you do want to keep certain things more private, it really is in your, but use these tools, it is your responsibility to go and look at the settings. So here's an example of what happens. I'm going to share a, an embarrassing story uh, in a moment here. Here's an example of a screen you might see when an app is attempting to connect to your Facebook information. And you might want this to happen, Monster Galaxy game. Uh, this, is the, this is the permissions that this completely third party website or software, in this case game, has access to. Really the arrow should be going this way. It can, it can do all of these things. They can email you, they can access their user ID, lists of friends, and all the information, any information you've shared with everyone. That's kind of a lot. <laughs> Make sure that's worth it for you. 
in the balance. Uh, so uh, somebody, a friend of mine, posted something on Facebook, of, uh, one of those like silly like videos, somebody doing something embarrassing. And I was at work and everything else. So of course, I had nothing better to do. So I clicked on it and watched the silly video. And, but before it would let me watch the video, I had to accept something like this. And I just wanted to see this such funny, silly video. So I just was like, yeah, whatever. So I go watch the silly video without me knowing it. No, I'm not going to go there yet. So, and I watched a couple more, of course, silly kind of funny videos. And then uh, dinner at night or when I might close it off. I'm like, come on, I got better things to do, like work. So I go home, and my wife says, oh, how was that video about the uh, uh, cat playing the guitar? I was like, what? Or the video of the uh, whatever other runs I watched. How did you know that? Well, you posted on Facebook for everybody in the world to see. No, I didn't. This thing did it for me. Okay. Uh, so a lot of times you'll see uh, requests from Facebook from other folks who are playing games. For if you ask me, again my opinion, uh, Facebook don't come after me. Uh, you know where those apps and games and websites basically hijack your Facebook account and try to get all your friends involved in your Farmville uh, obsession. Uh, <laughs> so take a minute and actually read these warning screens. They're for your own protection. Uh, here's another example, or no. So these are all the apps. So this is under Facebook, log into Facebook. It's easiest to do it on the web interface. Go to settings and apps. These are all the apps. I had over 55 different apps that were set up to communicate with Facebook, access my information, and potentially share with my uh, connections. This column here, it just says on, but what it should say is this app setting can, can post to your public profile. In other words, everybody, even people you're not connected to, can see the information that's coming out of Twitter and Hulu and HubSpot, etc. cetera. Um, I don't have it on the screenshot, but the other options are friends only and myself only, okay? So what's important to know here is if I go on a CaringBridge site, CaringBridge potentially could automatically post to my Facebook page on my behalf. A little scary, but you're in control. Simply click the X if you choose, or you can actually edit the permissions and the degree to which uh, these apps have access to your personal information. Is this helpful? Did anybody know this existed? Good. Okay, good. Uh, here's a screenshot of a list of what Flickr tab can do or access. A lot of information. Uh, I'm going to pause just for a second. Are there any questions on anything we've covered so far? Before I go on to the last section, which is device or remote device management. I do actually. Yes, go ahead. For social net networking, Facebook. Facebook yeah. as an example. Um, do they have, will they ever be able to, or can they now access the phone components of your smartphone, such as uh, contact lists, uh, text messages, things like that? Are you aware of that? Uh, I mean, as far as I know, uh, absolutely. I think they already, that, that functionality already exists. Okay. For a Facebook app on your phone mm -hmm. to be able to access your contacts and things of that nature. Like text messages. And you said, and text messages? Yeah. yeah I yeah. don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah I don't know about that. <coughs> but yeah, generally I'm not speaking, talking about like email contacts, I'm talking about contacts on the, uh, on the phone. On the phone, yeah. But a lot of times those are one and the same. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great, thank you for asking. A lot of times those apps have access to the storage on your device, which is, which is pretty much everything. Okay, this is exciting. We're going to talk about remote device management. As I mentioned a few minutes ago, I wish I would have had something like this when my phone was stolen, because then I could have tracked it down in a little bit more of a scientific way than calling it over and over again and hoping somebody answered it. Uh, we're going to start with how you can manage your own device remotely. Uh, on the Apple, it's called Find My iPhone. But it also works in iPad, works with iPads as well. It's a website or an app you can install, and is the functionality that you get to basically remote control your phone. So if you happen to lose it in your house or whatever, you can play a sound. Uh, if you hit lost mode, I'm not exactly sure what that does. I think it locks it and potentially displays something on the screen. Uh, and erasing it uh, does just that. There are a few more. Uh, 
I just want to give you a disclaimer. So there's a few more things you can do with this, like locate it on a map, uh, things of that nature. But the thing I want to make sure that you understand about any of these device management tools is that they only work if the device is on and connected to a network of some kind. Uh, that's kind of what it says here. Actions will take effect when this connects to the internet. So if the device has been shut off, the battery has drained, the uh, device has been wiped, uh, these things just won't work. It relies on an active internet connection to be able to actually track it down. Is it really really wait? In, or, or yep, it'll kind of stay active as a request until it, until the time that it does come back online again. Okay, so if somebody turned it on a month from now, then yeah, theoretically, it, this. Okay. theoretically, I believe, and I'm not sure how long it lasts, but for some period of time. Great question, thank you. Here's what it looks like on an Android or a Google device. You can go and do this today. Same thing with the Find My iPhone. These both are completely free. Things that you can uh, enable. Uh, uh, you know, kind of a lengthy list of all the different things you can do with Android Device Manager, uh, and you simply enable this under device administrators on your phone, Google Android Device Manager, and it will walk you through how to set it up for yourself. Really handy, and actually Google is a little bit later to the game on this, uh, but they have a length, again, a really nice set of uh, features. Very handy in the event that your phone is lost or stolen. Uh, here's what it looks like uh, when you actually log into Android Device Manager. If you have multiple Android devices, they'd be listed here. Uh, details, actions you can take, and uh, where I am on the map. In the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> zero, zero. Oh, yeah. Oh, is it zero, zero? Mm -hmm. Very tough. Uh, I'll leave you with this last, uh, last uh, bit of information. This is a screenshot of uh, Google Apps. Google Apps is a uh, productivity suite for, uh, for that Google makes for businesses and nonprofits. Once you add a Google account to your mobile device, be it an iPhone or a Google device, you're now listed, or your device is now listed on the admin panel of that Google Apps domain. Uh, so as an email or domain administrator, you have the ability to uh, do these things to any of these devices. Uh, you can block it from accessing the net, uh, accessing that email account remotely wipe wipe the account only off of the phone and you actually can just delete delete it from being able to access the list. The reason I'm showing you this is because I think that while you have these tools available, I think maybe a lot of people don't know that they exist. And also, if folks are putting corporate email accounts on their devices and you decide to remotely wipe their phones when they leave, you just might want to give them a heads up on that before you actually even connect their device to your corporate email system. While this is an example of Google's uh, remote management software, uh, and again, this is free with the free uh, Google Apps for nonprofits as well, uh, Microsoft has the same functionality, Office 365 and Host Exchange. So uh, in the event that something goes really haywire, simply click it and remote wipe, and you can uh, data safe. At this point, I'd like to wrap. Uh, I hope by now you've established a couple or at least one really great key takeaway. Uh, in a minute, I'll ask if you're willing to share that with the, uh, share that with the group. If you haven't gotten one right already, uh, here's a couple suggestions. Possible action items to take from here. You have a question? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, uh, I got two, two actions. Uh, on the Google, uh, uh, Google Remote Management Software. Uh -huh. Does this, th uh, when you say uh, wipe, wipe mm -hmm. does it wipe on the, um, the Google account or the whole phone? So uh, remove or wipe account would just remove that account. Uh, remote wipe wipes the whole phone. The whole phone. Yep. Okay, and my second. Go ahead. Okay. <laughs> my second question was uh, I would like to go back on the, on the, um, uh, encryption. Okay, you want to talk about encryption? Yeah. So uh, when you uh, reset the phone, mm -hmm. does it uh, wipe out the encryption so everything come back, come back uh, at a normal stage, right? Uh, so I'm going to rephrase the question just to make sure I understand. Yeah. 
If you encrypt your phone and then decide to wipe it uh -huh. and then boot it back up again, uh -huh. it will go back to the manufacturer's original default settings. Basically what it looked like when you got it out of the box. Okay. Great questions. Thank you very much. Uh, as I was saying, I was, uh, here's a couple of suggestions for possible takeaways and action items. Uh, we uh, talked about configuring your security settings on the devices themselves, and I say smartphone, but take that to mean tablets and uh, phones as well as even laptops, anything that's mobile. Uh, help the others you worked with. I hope that you'll take even this handout and use it as a, as a conversation point to say, hey, did, do you encrypt your phone? Do people actually talk about that? Maybe not, maybe that's just me. Uh, build, help build a security aware culture. So as we're talking about apps and maybe even deploying Dropbox and things of that nature in the organization, asking the questions, is this secure? Could somebody access this in an unauthorized way? Uh, what are we going to be putting on here? Who's going to be in charge of maintaining the, the, uh, the access list and the permissions? And then finally, as a general good, uh, good best practice, uh, since this is probably already happening everybody in everybody's organizations, if you don't already, consider establishing a bring your own device policy that sets expectations for those employees that do want to access their work email and calendar on their own mobile devices, that those devices are now under the control of the IT of the organization and what rights and responsibilities are associated with that. At this point, I'd love to take any questions that you have. I'm here. Thank you very much for uh, having me carry at uh, for nonprofits TechWorks, it's always a pleasure. <laughs>